but I am so grateful for Jack for stepping up and um, being able to present on a really short notice on a really big topic. So I think um, this is gonna be really great. Jack is kind of a self-taught naturalist from a young age. He's um, led many trips through California for Sierra Club. He's gone backpacking in Alaska. Um, he's been in many, many different um, departments through UC Davis. Uh, I think he's well qualified to teach us about global warming, and I'm really excited to hear his talk. So please go ahead and put your questions in the chat, and we will go ahead and let Jack start talking. I guess I'm on. Um, hello, everyone. Um, I would like to know a little bit about who my audience is and um, I guess that's hard, but uh, I got into this um, problem of global warming uh, about two years ago, I guess, but it came as, as rather a surprise and I've been very active since the mid 1950s in conservation, in outdoor work, in naturalist work um, ever since. And as you saw in the uh, invitation, I've got a degree in ecology and one in psychology, which uh, has inclined me to look at both the human as well as the biological aspects of problems. And this is certainly a huge problem that has come down the line. Um, I'm going to be reading mostly because I got invited to do this just less than 48 hours ago. And had not intended to, to put it together as a talk for another six months or something. So uh, you're going to have to bear with me as, as I read and, and a little bit stumble through this because um, I don't know how quickly I can go through it. <clears throat> but I uh, first want to say in line of uh, science, and I count myself as a scientist, more a theoretical scientist than a practical one, um, that science to me, and I think to most uh, uh, high level scientists is the endeavor of trying to understand uh, part or a large part of the environment that we find ourselves in. Um, you can talk about, the, I mean, the school systems and the media have uh, settled on the scientific method as being part and parcel and mathematics as being the language of science. But if you look at what sci the top scientists do, they don't get deeply involved in that. They're more like what Einstein said as far as doing mental experiments and, and mental observations and putting things together in their mind long before they start developing um, hypotheses or integrating their observations into theories. Um, and it's only after that that they go to the, the point of trying to formulate experiments to test their hypotheses. Uh, the notion of laws, in fact, historically was put together by, not by scientists, but by uh, lawyers um, who back in the 1600s, 1500s, that's what they were trained in and they were also natural um, um, historians 
I think was the term at the time. At any rate, um, that's where I'm coming from as a scientist. And so you're going to have to, to bear with me. I'm not going to use math. I'm not going to use uh, theories. I've read lots of them. Um, and I try and integrate my thoughts with others' observations as well as my own. Um, as far as uh, I'm going to have to put on my glasses here. Um, yeah. I think that at this point, um, I want to uh, jump right into giving you as much of a understanding of the global warming problem, how it's developing, what salient points are, and how we get to the, the point where it looks like it's a um, viable unfolding to actually endanger not only us as a species, but much of the biosphere itself. Um, decades of warming that the human population uh, exceeded the biosphere's carrying capacity uh, has been um, pretty obvious uh, looking back through history. I mean, almost every civilization that has come along has been one that exhausted its resources or been blindsided by a major climate change and then either disappeared or shrank dramatically. Everything from Mesopotamia uh, on in uh, all the continents. Um, in spite of being heavily involved with nature, conservation, and mountaineering since high school, it has been pretty recent that I realized the gravity of the global warming threat. Yes, I had pondered the Club of Rome book and Gore's Inconvenient Truth, but it really didn't click for me that these are high highly likely to be existential forces uh, terminating our biosphere. So what does the landscape after several years of, of digging into this look like to me? First, the degradation of the biosphere is truly happening at a rate that border, borders on the unimaginable, even of a decade ago, and the rate of acceleration beyond action, uh, any action that humanity can reasonably take to rein it in, um, is overwhelming. Our hobbled, the laudable efforts, very laudable efforts to steer humanity to anything approaching an understanding stewardship of our biosphere has apparently really been an abject failure. And I've been involved in an awful lot of, of those conservation and education efforts. And I know the, 
the people have, have worked really hard and thought very creatively about the process, but it hasn't really moved the needle in terms of humanity's understanding. Uh, natural buffering systems, which have largely blinded us, I think, uh, to the damage we have been doing through the wanton extraction and exploitation of biocarbon resources are rapidly becoming overwhelming such that atmospheric temperature, potable water, arable land, viable fisheries, and vial, viable biodiversity, let alone thriving um, biospheric sustaining ecosystems are likely to stop supporting our and most of our fellow earth ship travelers, uh, what they depend upon them for life. Our international governing financial corporate and trade institutions appear to be woefully incapable of working together to mount an effective, let alone a sustained uh, mitigating response to our abject addiction to twin culprits. First, the natural progress, that is the growth uh, notion, and secondly, procreation. Our growth of uh, the human population has been astounding. Uh, when my grand great grandfather came to California during and after the Civil War, uh, there were less than a billion people on the earth. By the time I was, or by the, yeah, by the time I was born, it was close to 2 billion. By the time I graduated from high school, it was close to 4 billion. By the time my kids graduated from high school, it was close to 7 billion. And just this year, we crossed the 8 billion mark of humans occupied currently occupying the earth. Uh, this is not sustainable. And you can talk about exponential growth, but I think it, it strikes me, more, it struck me harder when I actually sat down and, and researched the actual billion, growth of the billions in terms of my own lifetime and experience. So what is this specter of biosphere collapse that I've alluded to? It's a cascade of things. And unfortunately, I, I wrote this stuff longhand. Um, so I'm going to have to pause and, and figure out what I wrote once in a while. Uh, but going on, uh, production and entrainment. And entrainment, for those that don't know, aren't familiar with the word, just means to pull along with the main notion. And I'll use that word a lot, um, in particular with the atmosphere, because uh, things like the jet stream entrain lower masses of, of uh, atmosphere to come along with it, as an example. But the production and entrainment of, of greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, you're all familiar with them probably, and the entrainment of additional um, greenhouse gases uh, through the natural processes, water, dust, for example. 
and the uh, production of toxins, uh, pesticides, herbicides, halogens. Um, all are the starters of this process that have been building rapidly since the start of the industrial age. Atmospheric and oceanic heat sequestration is another um, stepping stone in the process. Climate disruption, runaway heating, stimulation of new and more intense atmospheric wind rivers and thermal homogeneous waste, sorry, air masses. And by that, I mean, um, and I'll get into it a little bit further on, air of a given temperature hangs together and doesn't mix with air masses of other temperatures. And they move uh, largely because of, of gyres, um, but we'll get further into, into that as, as we go along. And I've got a uh, live animation, if it works, uh, that shows how it's working right now. Um, ice buffer phase changes um, from, from water to, or from ice to liquid or ice to gas of seawater uh, or sea ice, glacial ice, permafrost, amongst others. Ocean buffering saturation. We're still um, just going through the items that play a big role in the cascade of collapse that I see going on. So ocean buffers, um, their surface temperature changes, temperature gradient changes within currents, and salt concentrations all are affected. All water uh, acidification, there's ocean as well as fresh water, as well as rainwater um, via the, the CO2 to um, and that, the, the acid form of the chemical when combining with water. Uh, free oxygen de depletion is coming online both in the ocean as well as in, in pockets of um, land where things uh, usually because of um, the plant cover uh, end up decreasing. So what are the dynamics of how this comes about? Well, overheating of Earth's troposphere. Um, and let's see if I, I may not have held on to that picture. Oh yeah, maybe here, yeah. For those that aren't particularly aware of what our atmosphere looks like. And since Jack, sorry, can you share your screen? Yeah, I will Please. in just a moment. Okay, gotcha. Thank you. Um, I'm trying to adjust it so you can see it. All right, share. Oh, wait a minute. What are you seeing? Share screen. Yeah, we just see the um, the participants. Oops. You. Yeah, there we share. All right, Perfect. so you see the Earth's atmosphere now? Yes, the graph. Uh, a graph of the Earth's yep. Earth atmosphere. Uh, the troposphere is the, the bottom part 
where 75% of the atmosphere is uh, and where all the clouds are, where all our land is. Um, and as you, the bottom that's disappeared is, is temperature. So as you go up in atmosphere, the temperature drops and that's a major cooling aspect of the atmosphere. Uh, then you hit a tropopause where actually a lot of chemistry is going on. And it's that chemistry that maintains uh, the temperature even as it goes up um, in, in elevation. And then you see the other uh, levels of atmosphere. Um, but the important thing is that bottom 75% uh, of the both volume and weight of the atmosphere. Okay, I'm back again. Um, so overheating of the Earth's troposphere becomes essentially incompatible with life. The source of our heat hasn't changed. It's solar radiation. What is changing is the Earth's ability to re-radiate that heat back into space. The overwhelming cause of that change has been our production and release into the atmosphere of greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide, amongst others. Uh, these gases intercept the outgoing radiation. Radiation comes in from the sun across a very broad spectrum of the electromagnetic uh, radiation um, range. But due to interaction with the chemicals that it hits, it gets re-radiated back out largely as infrared in the infrared band. But as that infrared radiation passes through the atmosphere, which and outside the infrared band, much of it does not interact with the molecules in the atmosphere. Infrared, unfortunately, does interact with the molecules in the atmosphere. And what happens is, um, and I'm off script, so maybe I should go uh, make it right. Okay. As the, as the infrared radiation runs into the molecules, it gets absorbed in one of two ways by either an atom or a molecule. Either the electrons jump um, to a higher level of energy level, quantum level, and then immediately drop back down and re-radiate. Or the radiation causes a change uh, through the electron distribution in the conformation or structure of the molecule, which again, then snaps back again, re-radiating re uh, the infrared energy level. But whereas the, uh, I'm having trouble with this left-right uh, mirror image that I see on the screen, uh, but as the radiation hits, it's going up. When it gets re-radiated, it goes out in all directions, all, um, uh, what, 365 degrees in um, all dimensions. So, in fact, that's what they say when um, the upper atmosphere 
with the extra carbon dioxide, green, green, greenhouse gases, is acting as a blanket. It takes that outgoing radiation and stops it. Um, why doesn't it stop the others? Because they're at a different bandwidth and don't uh, interact with most of the molecules and atoms in the atmosphere. Nitrogen and hydrogen and oxygen being the, the major ones. Okay. Oh, the other point I wanted to make before I leave that part is that um, the troposphere isn't uniform in height uh, around the Earth. At the equator, it's about 12 miles up to the tropopause that you saw. And at the poles, it's only about half that, or six miles up. That'll come into play a little bit later when we look more closely at the heating issue. All right, the accumulation of this excess heat energy engages numeral, numerous, yeah, numeral, right, numerous natural phenomena, which then exacerbate uh, the heat sequestration. So, what are the most consequential processes which are uh, compounding the heating? This is where the story begins to become more complex. <coughs> Pardon. Um, the flow of similar temperature air masses, and I alluded to this earlier, in the atmosphere and water masses in the ocean uh, continuously redistribute massive amounts of heat energy around our troposphere. And in doing so, or around the ocean, and in doing so are significant factors in the Earth's cooling process. And here we need to understand some of how this appears to work, the components of this dynamic have to do with first the surface speed at varying latitudes on a rotating sphere, the entrainment of gas and water molecules only loosely connected to that sphere, the earth, by the force of gravity or forces of gravity, the hydrodynamics of drag amongst the various masses, drag being the friction between air masses or water masses and the rotating earth, and the tendency of gas or water masses of the same temperature to hang together. So what's going on? This has a lot to do with the buffering of excess heat that we hear about by the Earth, effectively keeping it out of the atmosphere near the surface, which allows the temperature range compatible with life. Okay, here goes. The Earth spins one rotation in 24 hours. The Earth is about 24,000 miles in circumference at the equator. So the surface speed from a point in space uh, is 1,000 miles an hour. We don't have winds at 1,000 miles an hour. So gravity is in training the atmosphere to go along with the speed of the Earth. But most of the time, it doesn't keep up. So that should sink in for you that that's a major driver of wind speed. At the latitude of the Arctic Circle, 
the Earth's circumference is much smaller. So the travel distance in 24 hours is much less. And likewise, the surface speed is less, roughly about 700 miles an hour. And the speed reduction continues as you approach the poles, the zero essentially, since the drag in training both atmosphere and ocean water is proportional to the speed of the surface pulling it, the rotation of the earth is both a major driver of wind and of current, current of the ocean, of course. So yes, but how does this help move heat primarily uh, concentrated in the lower latitudes, that is down near the equator, uh, away from the hab habitable zones, the temperate zones. Um, for a given mass of air, and by mass, think in terms of numbers of molecules, not volume, its temperature determines its weight per unit of volume. Cold air sinks under hot air and pushes lighter lighter hot air out of the way. We have the, this notion that hot air rises, which is an illusion, an artifact. That's not physics. Hot air um, is said to be high pressure, which, you, which all of a sudden becomes cognitive dissonance. But if you think of pressure in terms of hot air in a pressure cooker, it's expanding against a wall and the pressure is high. But on the surface of the earth and as you move through air masses, it can expand. And so in fact, it's lighter per unit volume, even though we, or meteorologists think of it as higher pressure. And they often mistakenly, I think, uh, say that wind moves from high pressure to low pressure. That again is a misnomer because what's happening and a weather front, uh, an oncoming cold weather front will show it with the weather balloons the cold sinks underneath and put the hot air and pushes the hot air out of the way. And that's, and because the resistance up is much less usually than going sideways, that's the hot air rising that we see. Okay. Um, the next piece to recognize is that, and I may be redundant here, um, is that heavier masses in a liquid or a gas medium tend to move as quickly as, no, uh, okay, as quickly as possible down the speed or gra drag kinetic energy gradient. What I mean by that is you can think of it in a quick exper mental experiment that you've probably seen in the kitchen. Um, in a pan or a bucket of water, being stirred round and round, if you toss in a handful of rice or anything else that's heavier than water, um, you'll notice that the kernels immediately move to the center of this or the slower moving part of the basin of water. Likewise, cold atmospheric air and water masses are pushed by the drag of uh, rotation, that is the energy gradient, towards the poles. And that in addition to rotation, is a major 
part of the moving of heat away from uh, the lower latitudes. Another piece is convection, which meteorologists make a, a big point of, but I think is, is minor to those two others. Um, they, convection currents do arise in a complex interaction with the temperature gradient and with moving air and with streams of air. Um, I generally will ignore this because I only see it as a minor force when manipulating satellite data, data renderings available and updated about every 15 minutes. And at this point, um, what I'm referring to is the website earth.nullschool.net. And I will try and share that screen with you here. You see our wonderful globe, I believe. And yes, I can still manipulate it. So this is, um, give me f some feedback. Can you actually see the moving air currents? Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm nodding my head, but you can't see that. Okay. <laughs> yes, you can see them um, moving. All right, this is a wonderful resource for anybody worried about global warming, because as I've pulled up the um, control panel on it, you can see wind and, can you see my cursor? Yes. Okay. Um, you can look at air, you can look at oceans, you can look at uh, currents, um, and wind and temperatures, um, relative humidity. One I happen to like for the fun of it is the misery index, which is a combination of temperature plus uh, relative humidity and air pressure at the uh, uh, on the um, at, at the various levels of the atmosphere. The height here is um, appears to be decreasing because as you go higher in the atmosphere, uh, you get lower atmospheric pressure. There's less air above you. So the surface of the Earth is about 1,300 um, hectare pascals, uh, hectopascals. Yeah, never can get that right. Um, 1,000 is, is still within in mountain area, and 250 is the level of the jet stream. Can you see a jet stream going around? Yeah, it's moving. <coughs> up high. So this is what I was referring to as where I pick up my observations by and large. Um, I'd leave it on the screen, but you'll stop listening. <laughs> All right. I, um, I was just want to put it in the chat. It's earth.nullschool.net, correct? Correct. That, okay. I was going to share that with everyone. Um, okay. Um, so what is a striking force in the satellite rendering? What is a striking force in the satellite renderings are the massive wind gyres. And I suppose I could have left it up for that. Um, that range in size from a tornado to continental size, uh, which generally speaking, atmospheric scientists call, call them all cyclones the which confused me for a long time because I think of cyclones as the Eastern Pacific name for hurricanes. 
Um, but in atmospheric science term, it's anything that's um, a whirlpool, if you will, a gyre. Um, these gyres spin counterclockwise in the northern hemisphere if they are centered on a high pressure area, that is a hot area. And counterclockwise for a low or cold centered one. The leading edge as it moves across the face of the earth is known as the front or a front cold front or hot front coming through. Um, and the corresponding center of a hot dome uh, or of a hot gyre is termed a dome. So when they say we've got a dome of hot air, we're just sim simply sitting in the middle of a um, high pressure or hot gyre. Um, and I didn't get a chance to look it up, but I assume a, a trough is, is sitting in the middle of a cold gyre. Anyhow, the edges of these gyres move a great deal of air, as you can imagine, because what you're looking at in the gyre, I'm actually going to bring that screen back up. Um, uh, See if we can find, well, here's the gyre here. Here's one going counterclockwise. So that's a low pressure gyre. And for the fun of it, you can always go out and look at um, the mean sea level pressure at the, and click on it. And you'll see that this one is, is at 1060, whereas, let's find a high pressure one. Here's a high pressure one. Uh, it's not showing up there. Why isn't it showing up up there? Well, it doesn't matter. It, it will show you when I'm, I may be running into speed problems, um, the actual pressure. Uh, but these gyres, oh, let's go to wind speed. There we go. That's easier to see. You can see a high pressure one, a low pressure one. But these are winds, and winds, the wind speeds are colored uh, the redder, the faster. So you can see how much air is being transferred uh, doing to a combination of being entrained on a jet stream. Are we still back up the jet stream low? Yeah, that's, that's the 250. If you drop back down, things get a lot quieter because there's much more resistant from, resistance from the ground. Okay. Um, these gyres just move a lot of air around the globe. And often in between them, they entrain what's commonly known as a atmospheric river or a very intense wind band. Um, atmospheric river, of course, only if, it, if the water content um, Uh, well, relative humidity, you can see relative humidity in blue. The rest of this stuff is dry, but here's one in training a great deal of water up here. Um, elevation in the atmosphere here plays a big role in the, in the reduction of the effect of the drag on the winds. And as I noted, that's what allows the jet streams to form because they aren't, uh, they've been released from the drag. At the lower elevations, you see something like 
the eddies and counter flows that you see in a wild river. Um, and you've seen, let's go back to wind. Um, here, okay. Well, it's, it's getting quiet right now. Um, but often there's there's many moving gyres. Uh, the, the southern hemisphere has a lot more of them right now than we do up north. <clears throat> but you can see how this sort of mirrors what you see in the backflow and the whirlpools in moving rivers. And if you think about the equator moving this way at a thousand miles an hour and the atmosphere as a liquid getting pulled along and running into things and getting heat, heated up um, on the sun side, cooled on the um, lee side, if you will. Um, you can see how the, the current pressures uh, build and, and need to be redistributed. So jet streams, as I mentioned, tend to entrain air masses below them. And two years ago, the older patterns tended to limit, and older patterns tended to limit the mixing of Arctic air with that of low adult low latitudes. Over the last 40 years or so, as the poles warmed, the temperature gradients have drastic between the poles and the remaining atmosphere have drastically diminished. And our temperature measures show that pretty well. Uh, before holding the cold air at the poles, um, before when holding the cold air at the poles by the jet stream entrainment, uh, allowed it to get colder by radiating the heat into space. Remember I mentioned that as the troposphere is only about six miles thick at the poles, and twice that thick at the equator, so there is much less greenhouse gas re-radiating near the poles, and so the air up there can cool much faster than the re-radiation re from lower latitudes. Uh, I'll try and get through the rest of this in, in my 10 minutes. Um, the same sort of hydrodynamics take place with the ocean currents, uh, with the added complexity of a salt gradient due to the fresh water melting in at the poles. Moving on from the earth hydrodynamics, uh, what about the buffering phenomenon I mentioned? Well, ice takes a very large amount of heat energy to melt it, either to water or sublimate it to a gas. Since the last mini ice age, melting and sublimation of glaciers, ice sheets, and ocean ice has consumed a great deal of our greenhouse uh, retained heat. And the hotter it gets, the more they consume until they're gone. Of course, losing that capacity as it dwindles, uh, interacts directly with, with the rate of, of cooling that is taking place because of the melting and sublimation. 
and permafrost is now getting into the act as its ice and snow covers are removed. So is the ocean, so in the ocean, thermoclines and current upwellings have played another similar role in moving heat away from the surface. Thermal uh, induced currents do um, to the surface cooling effects of polar temperatures, the Gulf Stream is, is the poster child in the Atlantic, uh, seems maybe to have, which seems maybe to have, have uh, slowed drastically this year. Give a quick move to oceans currents, uh, current overlays. Here's the Gulf Stream. And you can see rather than doing what it used to do, and you can see very lightly, that there's still some of it going up. It used to come up into this section of the Arctic Ocean and thus get cooled. And it would return back uh, deeper underneath this surface current and then go through a route that encompassed the whole earth. Um, as these wor worldwide thermal currents slowed or stopped, they will no longer mix cold and warm uh, ocean water, which is beginning to induce a strong thermal climb horizontally between the heavier cold water, which sinks to the bottom, and the hot surface water, which just simply absorbs and re-radiates the heat back into the atmosphere. Shifting gears now to direct habitable environmental impacts, the diminishing ice glaciers and multi-year snowpacks are beginning to affect uh, fresh water availability to much of the terrain, terrestrial livable biomass to such an extent that major river flows, arable land, aquifers, and local climates are, sorry, are inducing an acceleration in desertification. We see this even in the United States going on, to diminishing biodiversity. And in nature, there was just a um, study of our Sonoran deserts this week published, pointing out that some 40% of the species of the, desert, of the Sonoran Desert have been lost in the last couple of decades. Death by dehydration is rapidly becoming a common observation worldwide. The cascading effect is that floral as um, plant transpiration slows the, the plants both run out of water and they tend to protect the water that they have by closing their stoma. And the dependent fauna and many insects and to a lesser extent, the um, more complex animals get an awful lot of water from plants directly. Um, become stressed and die. Also, the drop in trans... Um, transpiration and concomitant drying and weakening of the uh, foliage results in insect and disease predation, death, and an increase in the flammability. Thus, our wildfires, you know, and the wildfires have become 
worldwide and unmanageable. And we know them well in California and in the United States, but Spain, much of Spain has gone up in smoke, much of um, Greece has gone up in smoke. Uh, we're all aware of, of what's going on in the Amazon in terms of uh, fires and, and slash burning. Um, India hasn't seen it uh, by and large yet, but Australia has had outrageous fires that everyone is, is aware of, and Indonesia is also, um, and part of that's because of agribusiness, but it's getting burned off uh, very rapidly. And then as you go up into the Arctic and the um, drying of the perm, the melting of the permafrost and drying uh, of the foliage and the movement of uh, trees and shrubbery into what used to be uh, basically grassland or tundra uh, is getting burned because of lightning fires and the in inability of man to put them out. Um, so directly for us and many biota, the rising temperatures will result in our um, ability to, uh, will decrease our ability to maintain a viable individual environment and our physiological systems will de dehydrate. Amino acids in our bodies uh, tend to start tearing apart and will die. Uh, this begins to take hold for humans and most mammals in an effective way at about the equivalent of, and this is recent research also, 86 degrees Fahrenheit with a 60% relative humidity. It's not a pretty picture and it's, I've found it very difficult to put any sort of timeline on it, but on um, the positive side, I will say that we can look to, um, let me stop this and go back. Um, to our recent fires. And this is um, our intercoast range. It's part of the Stebbins Cold Canyon Natural Reserve. This was right after the 2000 fire. And you can see it has no, vo no living foliage visible. There's another picture up on the Blue Ridge looking up uh, Wild Horse Canyon. But even before the rains came after that fire, and this was early December, we see um, root sprouting coming back. So this says that even when the surface gets very hot, um, just a little ways down, uh, life can survive. Um, this is down in the creek and it basically got uh, firestormed as well. But after a year and some rains, we have green popping up uh, largely from the seed bank. Again, it was preserved by being down in the cool part of the uh, heat gradient that was due to the fire. You also see much more green coming back in the creek bed, the riparian habitat. Um, so this gives us a hint that perhaps our future of survivability will be much more like moles than it is like surface uh, dwelling creatures. 
And with that, I'll just say questions. I ran one minute over. I'm sorry. Uh, no worries. Amazing that I got through it all. You covered a ton of information. It was really, really interesting. I love, I, I wrote it down. I love that um, the globe with the, I can turn my photo. Start video, uh, the globe with the, with the um, airflow and everything that I could just watch that all day long. <laughs> really interesting. Well, right. thank you well, so much. Well, I hope it was enjoyable in spite of being terrifying. So I really appreciate you, Jack. I know that you didn't have much time to prepare, but I think that you had all the information. You just had to um, <laughs> probably condense it because I feel like there's probably a lot more information, but you had to um, squeeze it in an hour. So I appreciate that so much. Thank you. All right. Well, I'll say goodbye and uh, encourage people to think of themselves as a tragic optimist. I think that's a, I don't, I don't know how to answer that's that. Upon us. <laughs> yes. All right, everyone have a wonderful evening. Thank you so much, Jack. I really appreciate it. And um, we'll see everyone soon. All right. All right. Thank you.